Hello everyone and welcome to True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. My name is Alan G and I am your host. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and hit the bell to let you know about future episodes. And if you want to, check out our other episodes as well. For over five years, True Crime Man's Dark Imagination has been presenting the facts of certain cases with the utmost care and research. One of the main cases that garners an extreme amount of interest is that of the Whitechapel murders. We have examined some accusations, and yet we realize there will be constant finger pointing when it comes to the elusive identity of the world's most famous killer. This particular episode is based upon the accusation of a well-known writer and will examine her contentions. Firstly, we thought we would review the crimes, then present the evidence as it existed pertaining to this suspect. On August 31, 1888, Mary Ann Nichols combed the streets of Whitechapel in search of a client in order to get some money for a Doss house. Polly, as she was referred to by her friends, had lived a very squalid life. After leaving her husband and children because of her drinking, she settled in the Whitechapel area. Before setting about to find a client, Polly spoke with her friend, Emily Holland, at approximately 1 a.m and stated she was off to find some money so she could find a place to sleep for the night. Before turning to leave her friend, Polly stated, Look what a lovely bonnet I've got. Polly then headed into Whitechapel, never to be seen alive again. At approximately 3.40 a.m. on Bucks Row, now present-day Derwood Street in London, police constables found Polly's body lying on her back. Later. When the body was stripped in the morgue, attendants noticed that Polly's abdomen had been ripped open by a jagged deep cut and her throat had been sliced with two long cuts across her neck. Several other incisions had been made throughout the abdominal area with what appeared to be the same knife. Polly also suffered from general mutilations in the genital area. At 6.10 a.m. on the morning of September 8, 1888, Inspector Joseph Chandler on duty at the Commercial Street Police Station, had been informed there had been another Whitechapel murder. When police arrived at the crime scene in the backyard of a house located on Hanbury Street, they found the body of 45-year-old Annie Chapman. Chapman laid against a fence in the yard with her head almost touching the steps of the house. At her feet were laid two brass rings and two brass coins laid end to end. Her body exhibited signs of a butchered animal. Annie's entrails had been taken out and lain over her right shoulder. Her throat had been cut so deeply that her head was almost severed from her body. In the early morning hours of September 30, 1888, Louis Diemschutz, a foreigner who ran a socialist club in Burner Street in Whitechapel, turned his horse and wagon into the backyard of the house where he lived with his wife. As he pulled further into the yard from the street, Diemschutz's horse reared, 
and the tired man noticed a bundle laying on the side of the yard. Deemschutz saddled the horse and then poked at it with his whip. Deemschutz climbed down from the wagon and approached the bundle. He knelt down and lit a match. Deemschutz discovered a woman with her throat cut. Deemschutz went into the club and gathered assistance from the members there. Neighbors and friends later identified the woman as Elizabeth Longliz Stride, the third victim of the Whitechapel murderer. Later examination determined that Stride only had her throat cut, but she was dead nevertheless. An hour later, in Mitre Square, just 15 minutes from the first woman's corpse, lay a second woman. Her feet pointed into the direction of Mitre Square, and her skirt had been raised up and her abdomen had been mutilated. The victim was identified as Catherine Eddowes. Later testimony at the coroner's inquest on Stride and Eddowes' death determined that the latter had been in police custody because of her drunken state earlier that evening. At 1 a.m. on the morning of the murder, police released Eddowes and she walked out of the police station and her body was discovered 45 minutes after that. In addition to the cuts to her throat, the coroner noted that Eddowes suffered extreme mutilations to her face. Her nose had been cut off to her lower body and several of her organs were missing, including that of her kidney. Following the murders known as the double event, a police constable walked past the doorway leading to 19 Goulston Street in Whitechapel. Shining his bull lantern on the ground instead of the doorway, he noticed a piece of bloody apron. Above the apron, the police constable noticed some writing on the wall. The Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Once the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, raced to the scene of the crime, he immediately ordered one of the constables at the scene to erase the writing. Sir Charles stated that he ordered the erasure to prevent anti-Jewish riots. After the double event of the Stride and Eddowes' murder, on October 16th, a small box with a letter attached to it was received by George Lusk, the head of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, one of the groups organized to catch the killer. When Lusk opened the box and pulled out the letter, he noticed there was half a woman's kidney. The letter stated, From hell, Mr. Lusk, Sir, I send you off the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you, t'other piece of Friday night. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Sign, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Later examination of the postmark kidney demonstrated that it may have belonged to Catherine Eddowes. But then, it was discovered that it was just a cruel joke played by a medical student. In light of the double event, more police had been engaged to patrol the streets of Whitechapel, both in uniform and plain clothes. With the enhanced police presence, no murders of the type of the previous four were reported in the month of October. All seemed quiet until the night of November 9th, 1888. Mary Jane Kelly was 25 years old and lived in a small rented room located at 13 Miller's Court in Whitechapel, just off Dorset Street, where one of the previous victims, Annie Chapman, once lived. Mary Kelly was born in Limerick, Ireland, and made her way to Wales in an attempt to find work when she was a young girl. Some records indicate that she made her way to the posh London West End, where she worked in an upscale house of prostitution, where she claimed to have had fine clothes and gentlemanly callers. During this time, something went wrong with the life this once innocent Irish Colleen had. In April of 1887, Mary Kelly met a man by the name of Joseph Barnett, and the two almost immediately decided to live together. They moved from various lodging houses until, in the summer of 1888, Kelly and Barnett would move to the room at Miller's Court. Miller's Court could only be entered through a narrow archway from Dorset Street. Once inside the court, doors opening to the different rented rooms faced outward. On the night before the murder, Mary Kelly and Barnett had a fight, and he stormed out of the rented room. Kelly found herself in a local pub where she drank with some men and even entertained three or four of them during the course of the night. She took several of the drunken men back to her room. Witnesses reported that even after Mary Kelly entered the room with the man who would be her last customer, she could be heard singing, A Violet I Plucked From My Mother's Grave. 
For over half an hour, neighbors could still hear the young Irish girl crooning the old song. At about 2 a.m. on November 9th, Joseph Hutchinson, an unfortunate man who could not find work, saw Kelly walking the street more sober than she was before. Kelly asked Hutchinson for some money, and when Hutchinson stated that he had none, Kelly walked past him and down Dorset Street. Hutchinson watched as she strode down the street to find another customer until another man of Jewish appearance, with a felt hat pulled over his eyes, approached Kelly and spoke very softly to her. Hutchinson noted that Kelly giggled, and Kelly escorted the man back to her lodgings at Miller's Court. The man that Kelly picked up had a large gold chain in his waistcoat and carried gloves and a small package in his hands. Hutchinson followed the two into Kelly's lodgings in the hopes that maybe she would service him for free. Hutchinson waited for an hour and his presence was confirmed by another witness who walked by and saw him waiting for Kelly to finish. At approximately 4 a.m., Kelly's neighbor, Elizabeth Prater, was awakened by her cat, Diddles, when she also heard a faint cry of, Oh, murder! Since these cries of murder were commonplace in the East End, no one thought to investigate. The next morning, at approximately 10.45 a.m., the landlord sent his agent to collect rent from Kelly, who was three months behind. When the agent knocked on the door, there was no reply, so he went around to the window and peered through. The agent shrieked to himself when he witnessed the carnage left from the night before. Mary Kelly had been left butchered and in pieces. When police finally arrived and entered the room, they noticed what had once been Mary Kelly lying on the bed. Her throat had been cut from left to right, straight through to the spinal column. The murderer cut her from the vagina to the breastbone. He took out her heart, cut off her breasts with circular incisions, and put one by her head and the other by her feet. The murderer cut off her stomach flesh in three flaps and put them on the bedside table. He sliced off her chin, her lips, her nose, her eyebrows, her eyelids, skinned her cheeks and her forehead, and completely disfigured her face. Not finished there, the murderer then sliced off the flesh from her thighs all the way to the bone, which can be seen in one of the few surviving photographs. Since the Ripper was not disturbed, he indulged in every grotesque mutilation fantasy he ever dreamed. He totally eviscerated Kelly's corpse, leaving even the most seasoned police investigators nauseated. On November 10, 1888, sensing that he would be no closer to catching the killer than when he first started the investigation, Sir Charles Warren, Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, resigned. Throughout the investigation, authorities resisted offering rewards for information leading to the capture and prosecution of the murderer or murderers. But after the discovery of Mary Jane Kelly and the clamor from the east end of London to catch the monster, Queen Victoria signed a royal pardon for anyone, accomplice or witness, who would come forward with information leading to the capture and prosecution of the man or men responsible for the Whitechapel murders. No one came forward to claim the pardon. Created in 1907 by Walter Sickert, the painter, Jack the Ripper's Bedroom is a painting that hangs in England's Manchester Art Gallery. From the perspective of an open doorway, the painting, shrouded in shadows, depicts a dark room with indistinct furniture barely made out through filtered window light. An English painter and founder of the Camden Town Group, a group of post-impressionist artists, Sickert was considered an important influence on avant-garde art and made a name for himself in Victorian England. He was an eccentric man and his work was often mysterious and ghoulish. At the time, 
His personality and eerie paintings simply define the cutting-edge artist that he was. But decades later, a deeper look at Sickert gave rise to the possibility of another identity, that of the person whose bedroom Sickert painted all those years ago, Jack the Ripper. Born in 1860 Munich, Germany, Walter Sickert moved with his family to England in 1868. Before starting the Camden Town Group, he studied at the University College School in London. In 1882, Sickert moved to London and became the apprentice and assistant to James Abbott McNeil Whistler, an artist Sickert greatly admired. While working under Whistler, Sickert began creating more work that portrayed the seedy, unglamorous nature of everyday life in the dark corners of London. Through the late 1890s, Sickert continued to paint scenes of London's working class. Later on, these grittier pieces served as a jumping point for people to link Sickert to Jack the Ripper. It wasn't a secret that Sickert was fascinated with Jack the Ripper's murders. When he moved to Camden Town in the early 1900s, he painted Jack the Ripper's bedroom after his landlady told him that the Ripper was the previous tenant of the room that Sickert was presently staying in. In September 1907, while Sickert was still living there, Emily Dimmock's mutilated body was found in her bed in Camden. Her murder became known as the Camden Town Murder, and Sickert created several paintings and drawings related to it. The work caused controversy in the media, but also solidified Sickert's status as a leading realist painter. In 1920, Walter Sickert's wife died. She was a student of his who was 18 years younger than he. Her death took a toll on him, with his behavior becoming progressively more erratic. In 1926, his mother died, which allegedly sent him into a full-on depression. He moved to Bathhampton in 1938 and died there on January 23, 1942. At that point, he was only remembered as a prominent modernist painter. During Jack the Ripper's murders, Sickert was 28 and a little under six feet tall, he had light brown hair, a light complexion, and a mustache. It was close to descriptions that had been given of the infamous serial killer, but nobody then gave a thought to Sickert in connection with the shadowy killer. The first time Sickert was mentioned in relation to the Jack the Ripper murders were decades after his death, in the 1970s, when the royal conspiracy theory emerged. The radical theory suggested that the Whitechapel murderer was a member of the British royal family. In this theory, Walter Sickert isn't the murderer himself, but an accomplice to the crimes. The book by Stephen Knight, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, said that Sickert was forced into being an accessory to the murders by the royal family member. We covered this in an episode entitled The Royal Conspiracy. In the 1990s, Walter Sickert moved from a supporting role in the Ripper murders to the main character. Gene Overton Fuller released a book entitled Sickert and the Ripper Crimes, which drew on evidence that was given to her mother by Florence Pash, who was a colleague of Sickert's. In her old age, Pash had confided in Fuller's mother, telling her she had kept the secret that Sickert was the true identity of Jack the Ripper. Fuller also used clues in Sickert's artwork to support the idea. The name of Walter Sickert has been linked to the Jack the Ripper murders by several authors over the years. His role in the killings has been said to have varied enormously. According to some authors, he was an accomplice in the Whitechapel murders, whilst others have depicted him as knowing who was responsible for the crimes and duly informing on them. But, according to crime novelist Patricia Cornwell, in her 2002 book Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper Case Closed, Sickert was in fact the man who carried out the crimes that became known as the Jack the Ripper murders. As a successful and wealthy novelist, Cornwell was not restricted by the constraints of budget when she set out to hunt down history's most notorious serial killer. She set out to do something that few, if any, other Ripperologists had been either able or inclined to do, namely, apply modern forensic techniques to the Jack the Ripper case, and in doing so, solve, once and for all, the world's greatest murder mystery. 
When her book was published, it caused a worldwide sensation and the spotlight was turned on both Cornwall herself and on her suspect. She stated, I do believe 100% that Walter Richard Sickert committed those serial crimes. According to Cornwall's theory, Walter Sickert had been made impotent by a series of painful childhood operations for a fistula of the penis. This impotency had scarred him emotionally and had left him with a pathological hatred of women which, in time, led him to carry out a series of murders in the East End of London which became known as the Jack the Ripper murders. Doubts were raised about her theory when it was pointed out that St. Mark's Hospital, where the operations on the young Sickert were supposedly performed, specialized in rectal as opposed to genital fistulas. It was also pointed out that the evidence suggests that Sickert was anything but impotent. Indeed, his first wife had divorced him citing his adultery in her petition for divorce. In addition, he is believed to have had several mistresses and is thought to have fathered at least one illegitimate child. So the case for Sickert's being impotent appears to be non-existent. So what evidence is there to suggest that Sickert possessed a pathological hatred of women? Again, not a great deal. In Portrait of a Killer, Cornwell cites a series of Sickert's paintings that were inspired by the murder of a Camden Town prostitute named Emily Dimmick. According to Patricia Cornwall's hypothesis, this series of pictures bears a striking resemblance to the post-mortem photographs of the victims of Jack the Ripper. Now there is little doubt that Sickert was fascinated by murder and in finding different ways in which to depict the menace of the crime and the criminal. But to cite this as evidence that he was actually a murderer, and specifically the murderer who carried out the Jack the Ripper killings, is hardly definitive proof. When looking at a particular Jack the Ripper suspect, or any murder suspect for that matter, you need to be able to link your suspect with the crime. You need to, for example, be able to place them at the scene of the crime. Here again, the case against Sickert unravels slightly since there is evidence to suggest that he may not have even been in England when the murders were committed. A number of letters from several family members refer to him holidaying in France for a period that corresponds with most of the Ripper murders. Although it has been suggested that he might have traveled to London in order to commit the murders and then returned to France, no evidence has been produced to suggest that he did so. Cornwell also contends that Sickert was responsible for writing most of the Jack the Ripper correspondence and frequently uses statements made in those letters to strengthen her case against him. Authorities on the case, as well as police at the time, nearly all share the opinion that none of the letters, not even the Dear Boss missive, that gave him his name, were the work of the killer. They were the work of two enterprising journalists. Despite skeptics, Cornwell didn't let go of the theory. As recent as 2017, she said she was, quote, made sure than ever of Sickert's involvement in the infamous murders. She based her theory heavily upon scientific analysis that showed the paper he used was the same used in some of the mocking letters the Ripper supposedly sent to the police. Three Sickert letters and two Ripper letters came from a paper run of just 24 sheets. But dissenters argue that the paper was widely available and that the Sickert letters were written between 1885 and 1887 and he probably wasn't using that paper in 1888. Sickert may well have been responsible for writing some of the Jack the Ripper correspondence but since it is generally agreed that none of the letters were written by the murderer it only makes him guilty of having written hoax letters. In addition there is the problem that the style of the letters varies so greatly in grammatical structure, spelling and handwriting that it is almost impossible for a single author to have created all of them. In her quest to prove Sickert's guilt, Cornwall also funded DNA tests on numerous stamps and envelopes which she believed that Sickert had licked and compared the DNA to that found on the Ripper letters. Interestingly, a possible match was found with the stamp on the Dr. Openshaw letter. Critics, however, have pointed out that the DNA comparisons focused on mitochondrial DNA, 
which could be shared by anything from between 1% and 10% of the population, so it is hardly unique to Sickert. Another intriguing find was that the Dr. Openshaw letter, two other Jack the Ripper letters, and eight letters penned by Walter Sickert were all written on the paper that bore the watermark of the Aberdeen paper manufacturer Alexander Peary and Sons. The claim that he was also guilty of the Whitechapel murders is far from proven, and the Jack the Ripper case is anything but closed. As an historian, I've read many dissertations regarding Cornwell's assertions. I discovered that she defaced many paintings that she purchased to prove her point. Additionally, she considers herself the, quote, mother of pop culture CSI, end quote. As an author myself, I've always maintained the adage of humility, never considering myself an expert at anything and always willing to improve my writing and the understanding of the subject matter. To destroy priceless works of art, no matter if you purchase them or not, says something about the void of character Cornwell displayed, almost as if her desperation was more important than history or art for that matter. This is not to say that her theory does not carry any weight, but if one must destroy history to prove one's point, then this detracts from any credibility as to her accusations. Additionally, we suspect that the man known as Jack the Ripper had some medical knowledge. It has never been asserted that Sickert possessed any such knowledge. It has been stated in numerous books and documentaries that we may never know the true identity of history's most infamous murderer. However, it is always interesting and entertaining to act as an armchair detective. If this were not the case, this channel would leave people feeling empty as to their suppositions. Everyone has an opinion as to the identity of Jack the Ripper, and may I suggest that we have some sort of live stream so that subscribers may express their opinions about this identity and their evidence. I think it would be a fun program. Now, if you want to follow us, we're on PayPal, GoFundMe, and buy me a cup of coffee if you'd like to contribute to the channel. We also have a presence on Facebook, Rumble, and Twitter. And tell your friends about us, too. Until next time.